Thank you for joining me today. My name is Miguel. I work at BioLegion. I'm a senior manager of the marketing department. And today I wanted to discuss with you some exciting news we have on a set of reagents we have been developing for the last year or so. Um, these are reagents that are designed to um, enable simultaneous detection of proteins when you do single cell RNA seq experiments. Um, um, this is the, over, the overview of my talk. First, I'm going to go over the background and the SciSeq workflow. Then I'm going to explain what our antibodies are. We call them total seq, and how they integrate with these uh, workflows. Then I'm going to explain and go over some data that we have uh, developed with some of our collaborator collaborators. And I'm going to show you some new products and developments that we have on, on our pipeline uh, at the end of the talk, or the final uh, section of the talk. So let me ask you this. How many of you are doing single cell RNA seq at the moment? Can I see some hands? Quite a few. OK. Well, some of them, uh, some of you might have not been doing that. And this is a slide that I use to explain why some people are doing single, uh, some people uh, need to do single cell analysis anyway. And if you look here on, the, on this section of the slide, uh, and say that we want to hypothetically count the number of mRNA molecules that are present in a cell. If you look at this population here, and we try to quantify this red molecule of RNA, um, if you analyze the population as a whole, you may count, say, for example, five molecules of mRNA. That's a hypothetical example, obviously. Uh, but if you look here on this section of the, of the slide, and we have a similar population, if you analyze the population as a whole, then you might come up with a similar number of uh, molecules of mRNA. But in fact, these two populations are quite, quite different. Uh, the one here, um, every cell is expressing more or less one copy of the mRNA. But here, only one cell is expressing that mRNA. The other ones are not. And if we complicate that a little bit further with another molecule of RNA, say the black RNA, and we do the same population analysis, and we might come uh, with these you know, numbers, estimates, seven molecules of red RNA and six molecules of black RNA. Uh, if you do the same analysis on this population, which is similar, you may come up with the same numbers. But in reality, these two populations are quite different because here, uh, the cells are co-expressing these molecules. In this population, only uh, the cells are expressing only one type of mRNA. And that's quite important because obviously how the cells respond to a treatment, for example, depends on the molecules that they express on the surface. So depending on the molecules that they will express uh, tied to these mRNAs, that's how the cells are going to respond to that particular treatment. However, you know, the explosion of single cell RNA seq uh, data that, been getting, uh, that we have been getting uh, lately is powered by the information that this technique can give you. Uh, here in this slide, I'm showing you a typical Disney plot for um, a single cell RNA seq experiment. And you can see here for every single dot that we have in this slide, you will have a ton of mRNA targets that you can uh, look at these single cells. So that's a lot of information that this technique can give us. That's really good. However, um, the single cell RNA seq technique has some limitations, and this is one of them. Um, when the cells are trans transcriptomically similar, it's very difficult to tease them apart. It's very difficult to cluster uh, these cells uh, based only on the transcriptomic data. So for example, through decades of immunology research, we know that there are different T cell populations. We have the CD8 T cells, we have the CD4 T cells, and even within that, we have subpopulations of CD8 or CD4 T cells. Um, those are the cells here. So we know there are naive cells, naive T cells, memory T cells, effector T cells, and so on. Uh, it is the same case uh, in this sample, for example, with the fibroblasts. We know that there are different populations of fibroblasts, but they are very difficult to separate if you only look at the transcriptomic data. So if you know uh, a very specific antigen that can define this population, it's very easy to identify that population knowing that particular antigen. So that's sort of a limitation of this uh, technology. Now, another thing that we need uh, to consider when we look at the, at the signature of these cells is the correlation between the mRNA and the protein for any particular receptor. In this case, I'm, in this slide, I'm showing you data um, uh, pertaining to PDL1. PDL1 is a very important checkpoint molecule, you know, very important in cancer, we all know that. Um, what I'm showing you here is cells that are stimulated with PMA, 
and untreated cells, that's the orange or the blue line in these uh, uh, line dots. And you can see here that after the cells have been stimulated, there is an increase in the RNA content. Then the RNA starts to go down, and then it continues to go down over time. But if you look at the protein content on the surface of the cell, measured by flow cytometry, you can see that the protein expression in the membrane goes up following the RNA expression. Then it goes down a little bit, but then it continues to go up uh, as opposed to uh, the RNA content that goes down. So depending on when you choose to look at your cells or when you have to look at your cell uh, sample, uh, you may find that the correlation between the protein and the mRNA expression is not always you know, hand by hand. They can be different. So that's another important uh, thing that we need to consider when we analyze these cells and the signature they have um, when we're doing single cell RNA-seq. Now, the problem with protein analysis is that uh, traditionally it's been limited by uh, the technology that is enabling uh, protein detection. Like for example, uh, in the example that I just showed you with flow cytometry, <clears throat> if, if you are using flow cytometry to study proteins and cells, uh, you know that there is only a limited number of parameters that you can multiplex for any particular sample. So yesterday, uh, my colleague Kelly, uh, Kelly had a, a, a workshop on uh, spectral cytometry, and she explained how this is expanding now. And obviously, uh, the more the technology advances, the more parameters you can multiplex. But in reality, still we are limited to the number of uh, either fluorophores or, uh, in the case of cyto uh, metals that you can detect uh, in those instruments. So. That's another limitation that we have uh, nowadays when we are looking at proteins. Now, given that um, the single cell RNA-seq work can provide this vast amount of information uh, pertaining to mRNA content on these single cells, uh, obviously one important question that people were asking when they were doing single cell RNA-seq expression and, or gene expression studies using single cell RNA-seq and uh, protein studies is, can we merge the best of these two worlds? Can we have the best of single cell RNA-seq where we have thousands of targets in individual cells combined with the power of flow cytometry, for example, that's being used for many, many years to characterize all these important immune cell types? Is it possible to do that? That was one of the questions that they were trying to answer um, maybe more than a, one and a half year ago. And the answer they found to combine these two techniques uh, is here, instead of using antibodies that are conjugated to a fluorophore, like we use in traditional flow, cy flow cytometry, uh, they substituted that fluorophore for an oligonucleotide that can now be sequenced, and obviously then our readout now is a sequenceable signal, this one here, instead of uh, fluorescent light as it was traditionally being used for flow cytometry. That's how they managed to, uh, you know, kind of trick the system and incorporate this uh, antibody into a single cell RNA-seq experiment. So that's how we came to develop this product line, and we call it Total Seq. And as you can see here, uh, the oligonucleotide that is conjugated to the antibody contains three main uh, sections. One is the poly A tail here. Uh, you can see here that. And this is the part that is mimicking the messenger RNA that you can find in a cell. So all messenger RNAs that we have in a cell, they have that poly A tail. So this uh, artificial uh, mRNA, so to say, uh, is now being recognized by the workflow as a, a natural mRNA. Now there is also an antibody barcode section here. And this barcode, uh, this barcode code is always, in our case, following one given specific clone. So say that we conjugate this oligonucleotide to um, anti-CD3, and one specific clone, that barcode is always going to follow that clone, no matter the application that we have. And we have different uh, um, applications and formats that we have for this reagents that I'm going to cover in a few slides. But uh, in reality, what's happening is that this barcode is basically a translation of the specificity of this antibody. Say that this antibody is, again, recognized in the CD3 molecule. Whenever you pick up this barcode in your sequencing readout, 
that barcode is telling you that you were detecting CD3 in that particular sample. The Oligo also has um, a PCR handle. This is basically to make compatible this uh, entire structure um, with uh, sequencing instruments that we have nowadays, say the Illumina sequencers. So this is our total sick reagent. That's our uh, conjugate. And this is how this particular one integrates into the single cell RNA seq uh, workflow. And <clears throat> originally, this uh, method was published with the name of SiteSeq which stands for cellular indexing of trans transcriptomes and epitopes by sequencing. It's telling you, in other words, that in addition to the mRNA transcript, you can also detect now proteins using these antibodies conjugated to oligonucleotides. For those of you that are using single cell RNA-seq already, uh, this part here, the bottom row and all this section up here, that's the single cell RNA-seq workflow, right? Uh, what we're doing then is staining the cells with the antibodies conjugated to the oligonucleotides and then wash away the unbound or the excess of antibodies. And after you have the cells stained with these reagents, then you put them through your single cell RNA seq uh, process. In this diagram here, uh, we are depicting a drop seq instrument, uh, which is basically a microfluidic instrument making a, a, a micro droplet or a partition, they call, that encapsulates a single cell that in this case now it is stained with the antibodies conjugated to the oligonucleotides. In the same droplet we have this uh, bead that is conjugated to thousands or even millions of uh, oligonucleotides that contain that poly A tail that is going to capture the mRNA uh, that is present in the cell, this here. But because the cell was stained with the antibody that contained that oligonucleotide, that oligonucleotide also contains the poly A tail. So that is going to hybridize with the poly-DT oligo that is present in this bead. That's how the bead is capturing the mRNA and the antibody that I tag in this case, the tag that is conjugated to the antibody. And after that, you know, the bead is sliced and then you proceed with your uh, library preparation, amplification, and the sequencing of your sample. That's how it works. So that's the background of the technology. And uh, again, it was named SiteSeq when it was first published. Published, And after giving you some sort of background uh, on the technology, I want to move on and explain to you uh, and give you a little bit more of information about the reagents and the applications that we have for them. Uh, because in reality, what we really want to provide you is uh, an integ integrated solution for any kind of experiment that you're doing um, when you want to interrogate a single cell. We want to support, obviously, immunophenotyping, gene expression, immune profiling, all that with our reagents. By doing that, we basically want to support any type of research that you're doing. Uh, I have examples in my presentation for cancer research, uh, stem cell research. You can extend that to autoimmunity, immune regulation, vaccine research, any kind of research that you are doing, interrogating uh, individual cells. We obviously want to support that. And how we're doing that right now, uh, we are providing different, we call it formats of these reagents. At the moment, we have three. We have what we call total sick A, total sick B, and total sick C. And the difference between these reagents is how they integrate, we integrate with the different solutions that are right now out there uh, to do single cell RNA seq or immune profiling. Uh, if we look at the total sick A conjugate, for example, uh, we have more than 380 conjugates now at the moment. Um, obviously, we, uh, we plan to expand that even more. Uh, but the way that integrates with single cell RNA seq platforms is through the poly A tail, like I mentioned before. So, some of these, many of these systems, they have this um, oligonucleotide conjugated to the platform, <clears throat> and the poly DT section of that oligo hybridizes with the poly A uh, tail that is present in the antibody. That's how this antibody integrates with these um, uh, systems. Now, total sick B and total sick C, they were developed um, to complement uh, Tenex Genomics platforms and, and reagents. <clears throat> and Tenex Genomics recently launched what they call future barcoding. If we look here uh, in the middle uh, panel, in the middle section, uh, the future barcoding from Tenex Genomics expand on the oligonucleotides that are conjugated to the beads that are used to capture the mRNA. They still have the poly-DT oligo here, 
but they have two extra oligos here with dedicated capture sequences for uh, different applications. One of them is our antibody. So Total B hybridizes with one of the capture sequences that they have on the fusion bar coding technology. So it's no longer, the Total Seek B antibody is no longer using the PolyDT oligo here. It instead uh, hybridizes uh, with this other oligonucleotide. We also have what we call Total Seek C, and this reagent is quite unique because it's, um, it's being used together with 10X Genomics 5' prime kit. If you are doing single cell RNA seq, then you've heard the difference between the three prime kit and the five prime kit. If you haven't come to our booth or go to 10X Genomics booth, and they'll, they'll be happy to uh, walk you through the differences between these kits. Um, the relevance of this is that the five prime, five prime kit is uh, heavily used uh, by researchers that need to sequence the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor, for example. And at the moment, we have uh, the total six C conjugates that hybridizes with this uh, five prime kit. Uh, that's the difference between the total six A, B, and C. We have those three different formats, and uh, you can take a look at them in our website. Uh, we have developed uh, a large number of conjugates for the three formats at the moment. That's uh, how we are um, supporting all these different applications, and we also have another set of reagents. Um, for a slightly different application, uh, we call them cell hashing. And the situation with these uh, reagents is that, suppose that you have different samples and you need to mix them. Uh, when you mix uh, different samples, if you don't have, and doing single cell rna seq for example, if you don't have a genetic signature to identify that sample, then it's very difficult to tease them apart and also it's very difficult to um, identify multiplets that are, are going to be formed um, in the system when you have these different samples. Now, why would you like to mix samples uh, if you have an experiment? There are many different reasons for that. Um, one of them is that you may want to minimize the variability that you have in your experiment. Uh, you want to minimize the batch effect, instrumentation variability, handling variability, and all that. Uh, that is now uh, that is a valid reason, a very strong reason to uh, want to mix different samples. You may also want to maximize the data points that you get out of your system. And I have an example um, that I'm going to show you which illustrate that. You can also optimize uh, the cell recovery in your experiments. That's really important when you're working with very low numbers of cells. So that's one reason why you would like to mix different samples. Now, if I just told you that uh, identifying samples that are mixed is very difficult, uh, then you wonder, how can you do that? Well, the best way that you can do that is using our cell hashing reagents. And uh, that's how we call them, uh, because you, know, you can follow the cells uh, that are coming from a different origin. And <clears throat> say, for example, that you have these three different samples, and you stain them now with an antibody that recognizes all the cells that you have in that sample. It doesn't matter how heterogeneous is that sample, uh, the antibodies are designed to recognize every single cell in that sample. So you label all the cells with that uh, hashtag antibody, and you do the same, the same <clears throat> for every different sample that you have uh, in your experiment. Then once they are all labeled and you wash away the excess of antibody, then you can mix them together and do your single cell RNA seq experiment, for example, and then going back to the result, you can see. Uh, which cells are tagged with which um, hashtag and easily identify them, even identifying uh, the ones that are the, the partitions that are made of uh, cells that contain more than one uh, hashtag in that particular droplet. So it's this small, for example, it's this small uh, population here that you see here uh, with the green and the, I'm going to say pink color uh, for the barcodes. Uh, so that's what you can do with the hashtags. Uh, the summary of the, of the hashtag experience that we have are here. Uh, so again, they are, uh, we have them against human and mouse cells, and they are designed to cover as many cells as possible within uh, this particular species. Uh, for the human hashtags, it's actually a cocktail of two antibodies, recognizing these two uh, molecules that are ubiquitously expressed, uh, CD298 and beta-2 microglobulin. For mouse, it's the same idea, but the, the antibodies will recognize CD45 and class one molecules. 
Um, you don't have to worry about mixing them and all that. They are pre-mixed. So if you get a, um, a hashtag, a VAM from us, uh, the two antibodies are already there, mixed at a one-to-one -one ratio. So you just, take the, you just take that and stain your sample with it. And they are avail available in all three formats, total sick A, B, and C. Uh, a and C, we have them already uh, now on the website, on our website. B will be coming uh, very soon. Uh, we're working on that and finalizing uh, the process of releasing that VA. So that's the summary of uh, our cell hashing antibodies. And in the next uh, few slides, I want to discuss with you uh, some exciting data that we have been generating with some of our collaborators. Uh, that's what I'm going to do now. And um, because I just told you about hashtags, I'm going to start with that example. And here is a very interesting uh, way to utilize our cell hashing antibodies. This is data from one of our collaborators. His name is John Ashton. He's in Rochester. And John is interested in uh, CD34 positive cells from bone marrow biopsies of acute myeloid leukemia patients. Those are very precious samples for him. And, you know, they do a biopsy and they have to sort the CD34 positive cells and they freeze uh, that sample until they can analyze it. Now, he wanted to test the hashtags for a number of reasons. And here is what I'm showing you that. Uh, you know, after hashing and sorting the CD34 positive cells, he mixed them together and put them through the 10x genomics instrument. Now, look at these uh, cell numbers here. After doing the sorting in that biopsy, sometimes he gets 2,000 cells, sometimes he gets 3,000, but sometimes he gets 1,000. And he, if he uses only one lane of the 10x genomics instrument and only one sequencing for that uh, sample, um, he's basically wasting you know, up to 8,000 or 9,000 data points that he cannot use on that instrument just because he has that one sample with 1,000 cells. Uh, so what he wants to do once is one is to optimize uh, the use of uh, his instrument and optimize basically his protocol and at the same time reduce the variability that he may get uh, from analyzing these different samples because if you see here the samples that he's uh, getting I'm going to show you data from two different patients uh, patient one and patient two we just call it like that uh, and one sample was taken one, when the patient was diagnosed. That's the D. The other sample was taken from the same donor, from the same patient, when that patient went on treatment and after that went into relapse. So again, we have two samples per uh, patient. And he wants to analyze them all together uh, in the same experiment. And this is the actual result he gets. So if you see here, and I'm going to explain you what's the biological question that he has and what, what he wants to answer. If you look at this patient, uh, patient number one, for example, up here <clears throat> is the sample that he collected when the patient was diagnosed. Down here is the sample that he collected when the patient went into relapse. If you look at this, uh, at, at the left side of the Disney plot, these clusters, you may see that the samples, I mean, the cells are not really well defined, except for a very small uh, clusters. Uh, they are all blend together. And that's what they expect, more or less, when the patient go into relapse. That means that the patient didn't respond to the treatment. The treatment didn't leave a mark in the mRNA content of these cells. However, if you look at the second patient, uh, on the right uh, clusters here, on the same plot, you can see how well differentiated are the cells that, are, that, are, that were taken when the patient was diagnosed uh, compared to the uh, sample that was taken when the patient was uh, into relapse. What does this mean? It means that the patient actually responded to the treatment, but it didn't respond well enough that the patient went into remission. So what they want to do is to expand this uh, data set with patients that do not respond at all to the treatment, the refractory uh, patients, and patients that actually went into remission. And ideally, what they want to do is to identify genes uh, associated with these phenotypes and, you know, um, ultimately kind of understand the biology behind that and maybe design a treatment specific for these patients that would be more effective. But because we offer now the hashtags, they can do all these samples in the same experiment. So they can be confident that the variability or the differences that they see 
are not due to variability within the system uh, when they do the experiment. So that's uh, one good reason that they have uh, to be using hashtags, cell hashtags. Now, <clears throat> the second example or experiment or set of experiments that I wanted to show you is uh, this project that we are uh, doing in collaboration with the University of Chicago. This is a really, really cool project. That's why I wanted to show you, even when we don't have a lot of uh, um, proteomics data uh, to show you right now. But what they are doing is uh, they are looking at memory B cells. And they are looking at the different differentiation of those cells in the context of a new influenza vaccine. So what they're doing is they are immunizing some volunteers, obviously, and then um, they collect uh, the B cells after 20, 28 days of uh, immunization. This is a, a flow cytometry uh, uh, plot, flow cytometry plots showing you how they uh, sort and isolate the antigen specific B cells, uh, memory B cells. So you can see here uh, after vaccination, how the B cells expand, uh, the ones that recognize the influenza antigen. What they're doing is they're they are, they are making a, a tetramer out of the influenza antigen, and they are baiting the B cells with that, and they are sorting these cells. So what they are doing with that is this. So they have identified four uh, well-defined populations, you can see here uh, in this uh, plot here, and they, look, they see the classical memory B cells, these ones here, but they also see a, a, a different phenotype. They are calling that naive-like memory B cells. And they do that by analyzing different markers uh, in the mRNA signature of these cell types, right? So these are the cells that they want to look at. Ultimately, what they want to do is this. This is a rather complicated slide, but the most important part, it is boxed here. Um, and what they actually want to do then is to finally identify human antibodies with high affinity against the antigens that are expressed by the influenza virus. So in summary, what they want to do uh, for every single cell, obviously they want to do the, they want to characterize the mRNA content of the cells. Uh, in addition to that, they're gonna throw in their 38 different total 6C antibodies uh, so they can better characterize the cells that are going to be expressing the immunoglobulin that they want to look at. And in addition to that, they're gonna analyze more than you know, between 10 and 20 different antigens for influenza. And this is the, the goal of their uh, study. They want to characterize a repertoire of the antibodies in these human cells. But they want to go even further than that. And imagine what we can, uh, what, what can happen if they succeed in this, because what they want to do is actually clone the immunoglobulin of these human B cells and produce the antibodies that will recognize the influenza virus with high affinity, but actually that also can cross identify different uh, strains of influenza. So if they manage to do this, uh, imagine what, what can happen with uh, you know, human antibodies that recognize with high affinity different strains of influenza. That's gonna be really huge. So I'm really excited to see the results of these experiments uh, in the next few months. Now, the other example that I wanted to show you uh, it has to do with biomarker uh, discovery. And I really wanted to show you this uh, because this is really interesting as well. Uh, what this group is doing also in the University of Chicago, uh, they are taking samples from different locations uh, in the body of uh, lung cancer patients. And what they are doing is uh, they are doing the, the single cell RNA seq experiment uh, with 10x as well. Uh, in addition to that, they are throwing in there the, our total seq antibodies, and they are, they are analyzing every single cell, and they are looking at the different markers that these cells are going to express across the three different locations of these uh, cancer patients. And this is a uh, this is the clustering map that they generated using the the most uh, using 16 different markers to identify all these different populations, these different clusters in these uh, samples. Uh, when they combine those 16 uh, genes, they come up with the, with the clustering map that you can see here, and they can identify with confidence uh, nine different subsets in, in these uh, samples. 
Uh, they use then, in addition to that, 41 different total sick antibodies. And this is the summary of, the, of all the cluster expression uh, in these samples using the 41 different markers that they have from us. And you can see that there are some very specific markers uh, that they use to be confident in the phenotype of the cells that they are analyzing. To do what? At the end, when they can identify the clusters of cells that they are interested in, they can actually see, go back to the panel of antibodies that, that they have from us and identify the receptors that are differentially expressed in all those three different populations that they want to analyze. So you can clearly see here uh, the high expression of this uh, specific receptor that they have identified expressed in these uh, lymphocyte populations that they are looking at. So this is the basis of uh, their, uh, uh, their biomarker discovery and how they are doing that with our antibodies, actually. So in the last 10 minutes that I have after a five minutes interruption, I'm sorry for that, I wanna show you the new products that we are working on and new developments in this uh, technology. And one of the most common questions I get when I give this presentation, and I don't talk about this part, is how many antibodies can you multiplex, uh, right? So uh, the original paper that published the, the, this uh, technology, uh, the SiteSeq paper, they use 14 antibodies. In a paper that came about like a month after this other paper uh, by another group, um, they use 82 different antibodies. At BioLay, and we have done 220 antibodies. And to answer the question in the, in the title of the slide, we don't know. We don't know what's the limit. We don't know if there is going to be a limit or not. Um, this is not quite published in nature yet. Uh, but you know, there is a, an e-book that we have uh, made, and you can come by the booth if you want some more information about that. Uh, this uh, technology that we have developed. But to quickly show you how a 220 plex looks like, um, we, have, we are able to identify a number of different cells using these uh, antibodies. And if you look in this slide, we can if we just focus on the CD8 positive cells, we can identify naive T cells, uh, central memory T cells, effector memory T cells, uh, the Tempra cells, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. But we realized that you know, not many of you may need 220 antibodies, so that's why we're working hard to make smaller panels uh, that may cover more basic uh, immune cell types, like this TB and K panel. And you can see here how using this uh, panel of antibodies, we can identify uh, classical CD4 and CD8 T cells, B cells, NK cells, monocytes, and so on. And we kind of may, we're, we're working towards a kind of a Lego model where you can have a smaller panels that you can stack on top of each other. And the beauty of this is that uh, the individual antibodies that are barcoded, you know, the barcode is different. So you can always drop in any antibody you want in addition to the panels that we have. And you can build on the panels that we're making. Uh, so that is coming soon. And then the second uh, most common question that I have when I give this presentation is, uh, what about intracellular targets? You have shown me you know, a number of uh, slides with surface uh, markers, but what happens with the intracellular um, targets? And we're working on that. Uh, the question obviously is, how can we get these antibodies into these cells? And I'm gonna show you this example of uh, SAP70. And you can see here uh, in these Disney plots and down here, uh, the dot plots, uh, how we can see in the T cells and NK cells a high expression of sub-70, and B cells, they don't express uh, high levels of sub-70, so you can see them here, uh, the small gray um, histogram here. So we are we're working hard into optimizing this intracellular uh, staining protocol and have available um, antibodies against intracellular targets. So, uh, in conclusion, I, want to say, I, I just want to say that the technology is able to identify relevant immune subpopulations in comparable proportions to flow cytometry. I didn't show you this data, but there, has been, uh, there is a, a, a strong or a large body of uh, experiments and information out there already um, validating CYTSIG as compared to flow cytometry and also CYTOF for those, for those of you that are doing CYTOF uh, currently. It can also be used to improve uh, cluster resolution. Um, I didn't show you a specific data on that, but uh, for example, if you take the TB and K panel, just by using 
two or maybe 10 or 15 antibodies, you can identify immune cell types very confidently and then just focus on them and look at the mRNA, uh, single cell mRNA, single cell mRNA seq data uh, if you want to. It can be used to simplify uh, experimental designs. Uh, for example, John Ashton is, is doing that, uh, the data that I just showed you on acute myeloid leukemia patients. Um, and this is really, really, really exciting. That's why I have it here. There are new fields of, re of research that are benefiting from uh, these novel reagents. Uh, the most uh, exciting, one of the most exciting ones is the, uh, uh, the antibodies that are uh, being paired together with five prime kits, for example. Uh, for immune profiling of um, sequencing T cell receptors and B cell receptor, uh, that's very novel, and there is a there is a lot of interest in that uh, research field at the moment. <clears throat> What's coming soon? Uh, optimized optimized antibody panels like the one I show you for TB and K, intracellular staining for uh, the data that I just show you, and I didn't show you the uh, data on nuclear hashing, but. We are also working on that. If you are interested in hearing about that, please come by the booth and we will we'll be happy to discuss with you. And to end the presentation, I just want to thank a number of people that have been uh, you know, involved in this presentation. Uh, from Marlon, uh, the first author of the SiteSeq paper. Uh, he used to work at the New York Genome Center. Uh, John at Rochester, Nick and Linda, and the entire TotalSeq team that keeps on growing and Kim that's been working with me and the University of Chicago guys. And with that, if you have any questions, I have, I think, maybe two minutes after that, uh, after what happened. And if not, you can just throw me an email and I'll be happy to uh, continue the discussion with you um, via email. And before we finish, also we have the drawing, the Amazon drawing. Uh, Robert, if you want to take care of that or if we can take some, uh, a couple of questions first. Thank you.